In the previous video, we saw an example where it was helpful to factor out a helper lemma that we then proved by induction. In fact, there are going to be many times when in the middle of a proof we realize we need some kind of result that we haven't proved already. Sometimes the right thing will be to prove a separate lemma or theorem, but sometimes it's just best to stop right in the middle of the proof, especially if it's not something that's interesting outside of that proof, and prove it right then and there as a separate kind of goal within the proof. In other words, to have a proof within a proof. You can do that as a kind of inline assertion of some fact uh, using the tactic assert. Let's see an example of that. Suppose we were to try to prove this rather toy theorem about if we add zero twice to n and then multiply by m, that we've still got the same thing as n times m, right? Those plus zeros really don't add any information there. Okay, so after we would introduce n and m there, one thing that we could do just right away, if we wanted, was to try to replace the n plus zero plus zero with n. Because right? that's how I talked about it a second ago. I was trying to say, uh, when I approach this proof as a human thinking about it, the first thing I think about is, let's just get rid of those plus zeros. That's what we're doing, communicating to Koch here with this assert tactic. We're starting off by saying, I want to establish to assert that n plus zero plus zero equals n. And I'm gonna give a name to that assertion, which is h. So I do that with the assert tactic. And notice what has happened now to the proof state. My original sub goal is still down here. I, I still have to prove that later on, nothing has changed there. But before that, I've told Koch, I want to establish the truth of this assertion. Okay. So I'm now at the point of trying to prove that n plus zero plus zero equals n. Let's go through that. It is of course obvious to you and I that that is true, but to Koch, uh, these, are, these are not the natural numbers that have existed since grade school. These are just data types and functions over them. You're gonna get tired of hearing me say that, but I, I found through teaching many students this, that is one of the hardest things to get your heads around at first. Uh, is to start thinking of all of these, not as natural numbers, but just as code that you're proving properties of. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we know that we could get rid of zeros on rights and lefts. We also know that we can rewrite add, uh, it's commutative, we've proved that theorem. I'm gonna do this one with rewriting with commutative. You could try it with getting rid of plus zero on the left and right yourself as an exercise if you want. Okay, so add is commutative. So if I apply rewrite, if, if I do a rewrite of add com, uh, what does that do? That swaps it around so that, hmm, well, honestly, it's a little hard to parse even for me, right? So I know that it swapped something around here. So it must have put n plus zero on the right and it must have been on the left before. So that suggests that Koch was parsing this maybe as n plus zero with parentheses around it. One thing that can be pretty hard to figure out is where Koch is really understanding the parentheses to be in a situation like this. So a tip I want to give you is there is a vernacular command set printing parentheses. And if you do that, uh, I misspelled parentheses. Koch will now fully parenthesize expressions. This can make it much easier to figure out what's going on. So I can see here, ah, oh, I've got an n plus zero on the left, a plus, and a zero. So that's when I do the rewrite add com, why the n plus zero ends up on the right and the zero ends up on the left. Okay, that simplifies, that zero plus is gonna go away. Now I'm left with n plus zero. I could again rewrite with add com to turn that into a zero plus n. And uh, if I wanted, I could say simplify there as well, uh, or of course just doing reflexivity directly worked. Okay, so I surrounded all of that in a proof block with these curly braces. So we saw before that was an alternative of a way to focus on a sub goal instead of a bullet point. Uh, in terms of software foundations, this is a fairly standard idiom in our textbook uh, that when there's an assertion we wanna prove, which of course just means there's one single goal we wanna focus on. So there's not really a lot of need for bullets at that point because bullets would suggest multiple goals. When there's one single goal like this, we'll tend to use these curly braces to mark off that section of the proof. Okay, now I don't really need to keep setting parentheses for now, I just did that earlier as a demo for you. So let's uh, restore some of this back to the way it was. And 
at the time we close off that sub goal, right with that brace, now we get that assertion, n plus zero plus zero equals n, as a hypothesis in proving the real goal that we originally wanted to prove. And its name is h because we chose that name there. Now, if we hadn't chosen a name ourselves, as it turns out, let's see what cock does. It will, in fact, choose the name h. So when you don't pick a name, it's going to prefix h in front of something and then put a number after it if it needs, if there's other numbers, if there's other h's in the context already. OK, so usually, though, we'll pick something like h ourselves. OK, well, now we can rewrite with h. That is a fact that is recorded in our hypothesis here. It establishes the equality of two expressions. And we want to rewrite from the left to the right to replace the n plus 0 plus 0 with n. OK, we've done that. Now we've got n times m equals n times m. Ooh, nice. That's uh, just two things that are equal. Reflexivity finishes that off. QED. OK, so we've now managed to prove this little toy theorem. Uh, but we've learned an important proof technique for it in terms of structuring proofs in Coq, which is when we want to nest one proof inside of another, we can use an assert to establish the goal we want to prove, uh, use curly braces to mark off that section of the proof, and then once we've finished it, proceed with the rest of the proof using that uh, new hypothesis that we get uh, as part of the outer proof. Let's use that same technique again, but for a different purpose. Let's suppose we were trying to prove this other somewhat toy theorem uh, that says we can rearrange some additions. So let's take a close look at what we're rearranging. Uh, we've got n plus m, but over here we've got m plus n. So we've just swapped around the order of arguments in that first plus. Uh, the p and the q are the same here. The p and the q are the same here. OK, so we can introduce all four variables to start off with here. And what would really be great is if we could just use the commutativity of addition, which we've proved before, uh, to swap the n and the m around here. Seems like that should work. OK, but as you can tell, it's not going to. Let's see what really happens. Uh, we try to rewrite, and what do we end up with? We definitely didn't get m plus n over here. In fact, somehow, let me back up, the p and the q ended up swapping around here to the front. OK, so what's really going on there? Again, showing parentheses can really help understand. So let's do set parentheses here, set printing parentheses. And now we can see that on the left hand side here, in fact, uh, we've got an n plus m here, and adcom could be rewriting that one. But instead, what it's choosing to do is rewrite the upper level plus. Uh, think about this as like, there's a plus, and then there's two nested pluses inside of it. When we do the rewrite add com, we're swapping around that expression and that expression for that upper level plus. And that's just the way rewrite works. It's going to pick this upper level one that it found first. It's not what we wanted to have it do. So how can we make cock rewrite at the correct place where we want it to rewrite? Well, there's a lot of ways to try to control where rewrite does its thing. Uh, they can be very tricky to master, and they don't always do exactly what you want either. So as a more general technique, one of the things that we do in Software Foundations and in Coq is to use assert to be very specific about how we want to instantiate uh, the add com here, or another theorem if we were trying to rewrite with another theorem. OK, here what that looks like is we want to replace n plus m with m plus n at this rewrite. Since add com isn't going to find exactly the one we want to rewrite, let's just assert that those two expressions are equal, that n plus m is equal to m plus n. OK, so now we'll, we'll pause our main goal. We'll start working on that sub goal. And there's only one addition at this point. So add com cannot help but pick the correct one to rewrite. So that proof goes through very quickly. And now we have the exact equality we want in our hypotheses. Notice that it's an instantiation of that ad com theorem, but it's the exact instantiation we had in mind and wanted. So now we'll rewrite with h, which of course then will replace n plus m with m plus n right over here on the left hand side. Good. Now we've got exactly the two terms we want on either side. They're, the, they're identical. Reflexivity is going to suffice to prove that.
Okay, so that's another use case for the assert tactic. When a rewrite is not finding exactly the instance you want to rewrite, assert the instance that you want, prove it with the helper theorem, and then rewrite using the hypothesis that you just introduced with the assert.